In my opinion, succulents are some of the most problematic plants that are out there when it comes to growing joy with plants because, frankly, they're the plant that has the most false information and bad reputation that misleads people and often puts them onto a journey towards labeling themselves as a plant killer. Let me explain. I am the perfect example of why succulents can mislead you. Back in my plant killer days, succulents were commonly talked about as one of the easiest plants to take care of, something you couldn't even kill if you tried. Well, I brought succulents home, had no idea how to care for them, mistakenly put them in the wrong environment, and obviously they died. When I felt that pain of failure of not just killing a plant, but killing a plant that everyone touted as being impossible to kill, I told myself that plants weren't for me and I swore them off for another three years. And I have heard this story over and over and over again from members of our community or even just people that I meet. Usually when I'm out at a party or at a conference and I meet people and I tell them I have a podcast about houseplants, they always respond with one of two answers. One, oh my God, I love houseplants. Where can I listen to it? Or two, well, gosh, I really need your podcast because I can't even keep a succulent alive. Well, plant friend, of course you probably can't keep a succulent alive. They're super tricky. In order to have them thrive indoors, you need very specific lighting and you need a very specific indoor environment that a lot of people don't have. But my sweet plant friends, there's hope. Once you figure out that plant's needs, if you give it the light and the laid back relationship that that succulent and cacti thrives under, you can have a glorious collection of these cutie little chubby succulent boys and cacti ladies in your collection. Easy peasy. You just got to know a few things. Frankly, I haven't given a lot of airtime on this podcast about succulents. It's been more than two years since we've had another succulent episode. So today we're dedicating an entire hour of the Growing Joy podcast to the art of caring for succulents and cacti, and more importantly, learning how to stop yourself from killing them for those that need. Welcome. Welcome to the Growing Joy podcast, where we not only learn how to care for plants successfully, but how to simply and affordably use our plant babies to cultivate more joy in our lives. I'm Maria, author of Growing Joy, The Plant Lover's Guide to Cultivating Happiness, speaker, podcaster, and most importantly, an epic plant killer turned happy plant lady. On Growing Joy, you'll find conversations about plant care, plant community, and wellness through the lens of plants. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. Hi, plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks. Can you hear Frankie, my baby bird, in the background of this episode? (laughs) Let me know. Let me know if it annoys you. Frankie is chirping along. For those of you, I think I've talked about this on the podcast, but I got a baby bird in January. His name is Frankie. He's the light of my life. You can check him out on my Instagram. But what I haven't figured out is having a bird in my office as a podcaster. So sometimes he shows up in the background. So let me know if it bothers you. Okay, Frankie, I appreciate it. He just wants to tell you guys how much he loves you. At the top of this episode, I want to take a minute to celebrate a cherished listener, a longtime listener of the Growing Joy with Plants podcast, Marcia Castro Rosenberg. Marcia has been listening to the show for a really long time. She's been a member of my online platform, The Garden Society, for multiple years, and I have watched Marcia build her own plant business for the last two years, and she just launched her plant shop, Rooting for You, in Las Vegas last month, and I just wanted to take a moment to publicly congratulate her. It's been such an honor getting to know Marcia in my community platform, The Garden Party. She has had a full-time job, a long-standing career in a completely separate field. Plants lit her up. She wanted to move towards having a business that really meant something to her that helped other people connect with plants. And she has slowly but surely been building this plant shop in the most intentional, educated, slow and steady wins the race way. I was lucky enough to meet Marcia when I was in Las Vegas for a conference a couple of months ago. She got to show me pictures of the plant shop right before it opened. It is so gorgeous. It is so beautifully curated. She has the most incredible selection of common and rare houseplants and incredible accessories. Marcia, you've done such an amazing job, and I want to encourage our entire community to support her. You can follow her at Rooting for You LV, like Las Vegas, on socials. You can go to the website, or if you're near Las Vegas, go support Marcia and her new shop. It's called Rooting for You. So Marcia, congratulations. I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud to know you. Thank you for being a member of my community, and I celebrate you today. Anyone listening, if you're interested in being in our community and meeting amazing plant people like Marcia and so many others, 
all around the world. We have an international community of plant friends on my community platform and app. You can head to jointhegardensociety.com to join. It's super affordable. It connects our community of listeners. It helps support me produce the podcast. You can do plant swaps. You can connect about houseplants or you can connect about gardening. We have monthly Zoom calls where you can connect virtually with other plant friends for plant show and tells. We've got it all. So come on over and visit us in the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. Okay, succulents, plant friends. I said it all in the intro, but there's so much fake news about succulents. I personally have a negative history with succulents. So today we're celebrating succulents. We're educating everyone on how to stop killing them not just stop killing them, but successfully care for them. And Andrea, our guest and I, Andrea from JustSuckIt.com, S-U-C-C, we're really kindred spirits. She also has a very emotional wellness kind of focus, but focused towards succulents. We have this really amazing in-depth conversation. Just a heads up, you're going to hear me refer to Andrea as sucky. (laughs) You're also going to hear Andrea say the word suck a lot, but it's not suck S-U-C-K. It's suck S-U-C-C. It's something that she uses in her language with her brand. So just know that I'm not being rude to Andrea in the beginning five minutes of this conversation. It's a term that she uses that you'll understand as the conversation goes on. All right, without further ado, let's dive into the beautiful, glorious world of succulents. Here's Andrea. Welcome, Andrea. I'm so excited to get to know you and your sucky, planty self. It feels weird to call you sucky because I feel like I don't want people to think I'm saying S-U-C-K, S-U-C-C. Yes. And once they realize we're talking about succulents, it's going to make perfect sense. Exactly. Welcome to the podcast. I'm excited to have you. I was telling you offline, we haven't done an episode on succulents in I think like 100 episodes or something crazy, like multiple years. And it's time to shed some light on our sweet little succulent friends that tend to be very controversial in the plant space. They are because a lot of people think they are really easy to care for. And then other people will believe that they just kill them as soon as they get them home. So we're going to help people keep them alive today. That's what we're going to do. Yeah. So if you're scared to care for succulents, if you've killed succulents and you've written them off, if you love succulents and you just want a refresher, we're going to give you tons of information. But before we do that, I'd love to just, you've built a very interesting business, very rooted in plants and wellness, but through an even more specific lens than me, succulents, not just houseplants, but succulents. How did you become the plant lady that you are today? Well, it started about three years ago, and I lived in a house that had not been updated in 30 years, the inside and the outside. And I decided I was going to fix my front yard. And because I live in California and there's a drought, succulents are obviously very popular and the smart choice. Now, my neighbors are giving me cuttings, so I was introduced to aeoniums, which are really cool. I love them, but mostly aloes and agave. And I loved all of them, but it wasn't until I went to the nursery to get more plants and I was introduced to echeverias or echeverias, depending on where you are, and all the really fun little fruit fruit plants, succulents, I became absolutely obsessed. Initially, it was the Lola that got me in love with succulents. There's just something about it. Even now today, when I go to a nursery and I see a bunch of them taking up a whole table. I just stop and stare and think about how beautiful they are. So I became obsessed with Echeverias and I was working at the time and then the Crotopocalypse happened and I found myself unemployed and I thought, let me see if I could turn this into a business. So that's how that all started. I love it. We're fellow pandemic professional plant parents, right? Having to make that pivot out of our passion for them is beautiful. Yeah, especially with the Echeveria, Echeveria, however you want to pronounce it, there's like a geometry to them that is so mesmerizing. And I think a lot of succulents that, you know, houseplants have geometry true, but these rosette type succulents are so mesmerizing and comforting to look at. Fractals are they're scientifically proven to like be relaxing to watch. And you see them in succulents all over the place. No, they're just geometric perfection. And there's something about that that is really calming for the soul. Yeah, it's so nice. I also love, you know, people think about succulents mostly as indoor houseplants, but they are a very sustainable option for you Californians who I'm so jealous of that you just get to like live where the succulents grow so naturally. What does your yard look like now? What did you end up choosing? Well, I actually don't live at that home anymore. So all of the plants 
The only thing I took out of the yard were my Aeonium Sunburst. I love those. They're beautiful. I'm in a, an apartment now, so I just have potted plants everywhere, mostly Aeoniums, my personal collection of fancy aloes and echeverias. That's about it. Right now, all my space, everything that I keep at home is typically for work now. So I minimize my own personal collection for a while. And is your personal collection, if it's indoors, under grow lights or it's still outside? It's still outside because I'm in California. Yay. Yeah, you lucky duck, man. That's so nice. (laughs) Yes. It's paradise for succulents here. Yeah, totally. So it's interesting. I mean, I guess you're approaching them not even as houseplants. You're really approaching them more as landscape plants in the work that you do. Well, not I, there, I have small potted plants. I When I started, it was for landscaping, but now it's more about the etch of areas and adding beauty to the home. I do have grow lights at the warehouse, so I store plants at home, and I also have a warehouse. I keep a small amount there, and usually those are Haworthias and my snake plants. I use those a lot in, in some of my orders. Mm -hmm. And you make the pretty, I was looking at your Instagram, you make the prettiest succulent arrangements. I feel like succulents make a beautiful arrangement. You've got to have the light for them. But succulents, you know, with their various colors, I mean, you see so many more colors in succulents than you do in house plants and how small they are. So you could make a big pot filled with so many, you can get such a beautiful variety. Whereas house plants, you know, you're really dealing with maybe one or two in some sort of arrangement. That must be so fun. And what does your business look like? You have so many multiple facets of it, but you are shipping succulents to people's homes. Yes. Initially, I started off as a gift company, and I had fun little themed gift boxes like dating socks or quarantine socks, because that was obviously very popular during the quarantine. And they all came with a little pot of plant and then something fun. I have a box called the Pamper Me Box with spa items and a little plant. And that's how it started. But then people started asking me, hey, do you have a PVN, a Pearl Von Nuremberg? Or hey, can you get me a string of pearls? And I was resistant to selling to collectors, which was really silly because I'm a collector and I have access to I'm in California. So it's evolved from a gift company to do you want a succulent? I got that for you too. Yeah, it's definitely a nice mixture. It's so cool. So let's dive in to all things succulents. I want to say succulents kind of ruined my life as a plant killer because succulents were the plant that I killed that made me finally be like, that's it. I can't care for plants. I'm sticking to cut flowers and that's it. And I didn't care for plants for like three or four years until I kind of got back into them. Everybody on this podcast knows my story, but And then I've got to be honest with you, I've shied away from succulents ever since then because I still feel that deep pain. But succulents are very triggering for people. They can be. And once you get a handle on how to care for them and the setup is correct, then they really are low maintenance. But they really aren't for everybody. And that's something that has to be shared. Well, I shouldn't say that. There are some that are for everybody, like Haworthias or snake plants. They're really low maintenance, can handle low light conditions. They're okay. But then there are other plants like the Echeverias and the Graptivarias that need more light than what people often think. And then they start to stretch and then they get sad. And if you're a houseplant person, then you are used to watering more often. And with succulents, one of the fastest way to kill your succulent is to overwater. And when I say overwater, I mean water it more often than it needs, not giving it a lot of water all at once. So there's a difference when it comes to watering succulents. So it's really just a matter of deciding where you're going to keep your succulent, how much light it's going to get, or how much artificial light you're willing to invest for it, and then you just go from there. Yeah. I can't tell you how many times I've gotten notes from listeners or even friends texting me pictures of the most stretched, etioliated succulent being like, oh my God, my succulent's growing. It's so happy. It's growing so much. And I'm like, oh, it breaks my heart to be like, oh no, it's actually super unhappy. And that etioliation or that stretching is actually the plant looking for light. Please put that in your windowsill. So what would you say are like the top three reasons why people kill succulents? One, overwatering, and that means watering too frequently, not giving it enough light. That's the other one because it needs light for photosynthesis. And also airflow. Airflow is often overlooked. And if you go to a succulent nursery, I you know, I don't know a lot about houseplants and I don't really go to any other nurseries except succulent nurseries. So this is from the perspective of someone who only deals with succulents. When I go to a succulent nursery, even the greenhouse has huge fans that they blow towards the plants. So airflow is really important for plants too, succulents. 
If you've thought about growing succulents or cacti, you've likely heard that they need fast-draining potting mix. But like, what does fast-draining even mean, right? Well, Espoma Organic has taken the guesswork out of this conundrum by creating a potting mix specifically for your plants that like fast-draining soil, like your succulents, your cacti, and citrus, and it's called their Organic Cacti Mix. It's the orange bag in the Espoma section of your local garden center, and it is filled with everything your drought-tolerant plant babies need, lots of aged forest products like bark and sticks and perlite for drainage, and mycorrhizal fungi to help promote root growth and water retention. Limey, my lime tree, is planted in the Espoma cacti mix, as well as some of my succulents and my jade plant collection. I also like keeping a bag of the cacti mix around with my general potting mix, because for my plants like Hoya that like a little bit of a chunkier mix, a little bit faster draining mix than just a normal general potting mix, I'll mix the succulent mix and the potting mix together to make more of like an aeroid-friendly potting mix for houseplants. But honestly, plant friends, whatever you're growing, Espoma Organic has the potting mix for you. For indoor houseplant parents, it's their general mix that I have all my houseplants in, their cacti mix, or even their orchid mix or their bonsai mix. And for you outdoor gardeners, they've got all the garden soils, all the potting mixes, all the fertilizers you're going to need this year. They've got garden soils, lawn soil, raised bed mix, and all the fertilizers and compost you need. You should definitely be using their line of tones or their line of plant food that they have created for the garden. They have all sorts of different tones that are specifically created for different plants that you grow, like their garden tone, their flower tone, their bulb tone, their rose tone. Whatever you're growing, they probably have a tone for it. To learn more about all of the different Espoma products that you can use for your indoor and outdoor plant collections, you can go to espoma.com to find your local garden center near you. Or you can visit the link in the show notes to go to my Amazon storefront where I have an Espoma storefront where I've curated a list of all the products that I love and use in my garden. Once again, that's Espoma Organic. They've got all the best products for your indoor and outdoor gardens to help them thrive. Plant Friends, Territorial Seed Company is dedicating this week's ad time not to talking about their products, but to educating you all about the glory of garlic scapes. If you've tried them, you know. It's that time of year when we're enjoying garlic scapes, you harvest them from the garlic that you grow, and Territorial Seed Company is the go-to resource for any variety of garlic that you want to try growing. So, what is a scape? It's the curled up tip of the stalk that emerges from the center of the garlic bulb, and it's what makes that hard central stem of hard neck garlics. So you should harvest scapes because as they develop, the scapes actually rob the plant of the energy that otherwise would go into growing the actual garlic bulb. So by trimming the scapes this time of year, you improve your garlic harvest and you get a healthy, delicious garlicky treat. So it's a total win-win situation. Territorial Seed Company wants you to know the key to harvesting scapes is to let them get as large as possible before they turn woody and then snipping them. They can be cut or snapped off at the top of the plant where it joins the top leaf. Enjoy scapes steamed, sautéed, or grilled. You can even make them into a pesto. You could put them in salads, soups, sandwiches, stir-fry, and more. So if you want to grow your own garlic to have your own garlic bulbs, but also your scapes, it's so simple and so rewarding, and it's not too early to pre-order your garlic for the fall shipment. And varieties at Territorial Seed Company sell out quickly. Plus, Territorial Seed Company gives us 10% off because we're growing joy listeners. All you got to do is visit territorialseed.com slash growing joy to shop an amazing garlic selection and get a 10% discount. Once again, that's territorialseed.com slash growing joy, territorialseed.com slash growing joy. I think two succulents end up being gifted a lot. Like they're the party favor at a wedding. They're the little plant that gets shipped to you because they're so small, so they're easier to get shipped. They're the, you know, succulent arrangement that you're gifted for a funeral or some sort of life event. And so I feel like a lot of people actually get succulents not really understanding how to care for them. Like it's not an intentional purchase. It's a gift. And then you either figure it out and care for it and have it thrive, or like what I hear is you get gifted it, you don't really know how to take care of it, and then, you know, it's withering and shriveling up kind of past the point of no return. So I think that's super interesting. On the converse, what about a couple of reasons why people should try succulents? Well, once you get a handle on them, they really make incredible plants. There's so many varieties of them. They're beautiful to look at. And they just inspire happiness. And they're pretty much 
life coaches in plant form too, the way they adapt and thrive. And that's one of the reasons why I think they're really fun. Yeah, I love it. I love the chubby ones. I love the jelly bean ones. I mean, they're fascinating to look at. Would lithops be considered a succulent? Yeah, it's in the succulent family. I've only ever had one because they scare me. Everyone says you got to be careful about the water. And that's even worse than like, I like succulents because I don't have to water that much. But one that you get a little drop of water and then it's a goner. I don't know. I'm not sure I have the confidence for that yet. The self-esteem for that yet. But lithops are in that, in the family. Yeah, no, I think lithops. I'm also, I've never had one. I'm, I'm very curious because that is like just an alien plant with the way that they bloom and the way that they grow and multiply. They're, I love what you said. They, there are so many varieties. And I'll always remember when I, in the first couple of years, in the first year of me being a plant parent, I went to California and going to these succulent nurseries in California and seeing the blue succulents and the black succulents. Oh boy, I killed a, I think it's called a black knight or shining knight, a very dark. Mm -hmm. There's a black knight and a black prince. There are two different ones that look very similar. Oh boy. I brought that back to my New York City apartment. <laughs> I put it in a Southern facing window, but it did not last very long because the, I just could not give it enough light. I have to say those are moody, just so you know. There are some succulents that are really easy to care for and you can put them down, they get the right light, they're happy. And then there are other extra areas like those that are a little moodier than others. And they're, you have to get everything just right for them. Like the strings, the string of pearls, a lot of times people will get them in the month that they're gone. I know. Those string of pearls are a pain point for a lot of people. They're so beautiful. I had the most exquisite string of pearls with like three feet long hair. She was so beautiful. And when we moved, she did not make it. She liked to be in that one position that she had in our southern facing window. And the minute we started moving her around, she was like, I'm out. But man, they're magical little plants. And you don't see them bloom in New York, but you see them in bloom in California. And any of those strings are so beautiful. You know what? I'm not a huge fan of the blooms on the pearls. They're a hot mess. They remind me of, you know, dandelions when they turn into the little puffy thing. They're really hard to clean. Now, the ruby necklace, gorgeous. Yellow blooms. I love those. They don't make a mess. But the tears and the pearls, not my favorite. When I see them, I cut them off. Sorry if I offend anybody about that out there. No, that's fine. I think the first time I saw them blooming, it was just like, oh my God, this plant blooms. And it's like, of course it blooms, duh, all the plants bloom. But it was just like, it was so wild. I think as a New Yorker, every time I go to California and I see Sansevieria as hedging and I see all these different plants that for us are so high maintenance in our homes and they're just like thriving in the street. It's just like always such a shock. Okay, so why do we get into succulent care basics? I want to talk to you about succulent care. I want to talk to you about succulent propagation. And I also want to just grill you, not grill you, but I want to pick your brain a little bit about like good succulent options for beginners and maybe good succulent options for like more advanced plant parents. Because I think, like you said, there's such variety and people only know like Echeveria. And, you know, I think sometimes when people think succulent, they just think Echeveria, the rosettes, or they just think cacti or jade or something. So before that, let's dive into how do you stop killing succulents? Let's from now on, after people listen to this, we're going to empower you to stop killing your succulents. So where do we begin? Where should we start? Water? Yes, water. Before you water your succulent, you have to feel the soil. The soil has to be really dry. Succulents are prone to root rot. So if they're stuck in wet soil for an extended period of time, they're going to die. So the First thing to do is check the soil. I always just put my finger in the pot, see what's happening. And if it doesn't feel wet, if it feels dry, sometimes I still wait a couple more days if my plant is still looking happy. But if it's bone dry, waterboard it. Give it a lot of water as long as it has a drainage hole. And then wait. Wait until it's dry again. I always suggest getting on a checking schedule and not a watering schedule. People will have this watering schedule and say, I'm just going to water on Saturdays. But when you do that to a succulent that doesn't need water, you're risking it being killed. So get on a checking schedule. And the good thing about that is that if you check one of your plants and it can use some water and another one, you can wait a few days. The one that needs water will be just fine. And then you can water more all at once. So get on a checking schedule. I love that. I think you bring up a good point about, we talk about on this podcast a lot, like mimicking nature, right? Our plants were not designed to be indoors. We're just trying to do our best, pretending that we're nature. And if you think about it, when they're in the desert, there's huge downpour and then long periods of drought. 
So it makes sense that when you're watering your succulent, you're giving it a large, robust drink of water and then allowing it to have that period of drought before watering it again. Because I think some people who get scared to overwater the succulent give it like the tiniest little drink and then give it a drought and then give it another tiny drink so those roots never get to like fully replenish. Can you talk a little bit about the adaptations in succulent leaves that are affected by watering? So a succulent is a succulent because it holds water somewhere in its tissue. So some hold it in their leaves, some in their stems, some in the root. Now, plants like an Echeveria, especially the ones with the big chunky leaves, a lot of the water is stored in the leaves. So you can tell if your plant is happy, if the leaf is full and chunky and looks fabulous. When it starts to get wrinkly or droopy or soft, then you know that, it, and if it's not yellow, then it's time to water it. Yeah. So... You know, when you're thinking about how much water these plants are uptaking into their leaves or their stem, that deep water is really necessary because they need to grab on. They need to drink up light. I mean, I'm just thinking about the succulents that I killed in my plant killer days and how I used to put – so first mistake is I put the succulents in a teacup with no drainage. So I just like drowned them. And also, Andrea just mentioned root rot. Root rot happens when – the roots sit in water and they literally rot and disintegrate. So sometimes when you have a plant that has root rot, you'll take the plant out and it won't have any more roots. That's root rot. And that's what happened to my sweet little succulents and teacups. They just like sat in a little teacup of water and then died. And then I put them 10 feet from a window, <laughs> like a real bonehead. So light, probably the most important part of a succulent survival. Talk to us about light. Light is essential to help the succulent maintain its shape, especially a plant like an Echeveria or Graptivaria, any of the hybrids. Now, a lot of times people will put their plant in front of a window and think that's bright, I mean, think that's direct light. But the window actually acts as a filter, so that's considered indirect light. Direct sunlight would be a plant outside with sun hitting it. So a window, the best window for a succulent would be a south-facing window that actually gets about eight hours of direct, or when I say direct, you know, sunlight that's actually beaming in through the window. Even though a room is bright, if a succulent is in the middle of the room on a table, a lot of them will start to stretch. It's not enough light to keep them happy and to keep their shape. I always recommend when people get a succulent, they take a picture of it the day that they get it, because sometimes the small changes are not noticeable. And if you can catch a plant that's starting to stretch early enough, you can just move it someplace else and it'll maintain its shape. But once it gets all long and, and mangy, there's not a whole lot you can do to save it other than to cut it and to propagate it. I love that tip to take a picture of it when you buy it because it's not like a houseplant where it's going to grow so much that it's going to look so different. A succulent is small. It's really going to look, it's going to stay essentially kind of the same size. So you can compare it to that original photo. I love that tip. Really important. Plus you can tell if it's maintaining its shape, but is the color kind of faded because light affects the color as well. So a photo just really helps with all of that. Yeah. And with light, another thing I learned is the more colorful the plant is, the more light it needs. So those pinks, those blues, those purples, those need more light than like a normal green Echeveria, right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So interesting. So if someone is trying to care for succulents in doors, they're putting it on a southern facing window or probably popping it under a grow light. Yes. And I like the Barina T5. So I think it's Barina T5. Those work really, really well. You can even get a little tabletop one if you only have a couple of succulents to keep them happy. They're really accessible and not very expensive anymore. So just get a grow light and keep your succulent happy. I don't have it right now, but I had a desk lamp that I had my Soltec Vita grow bulb in, and I had a bunch of Hoya, tiny pots of little Hoya cuttings, which are basically succulents. And they were so happy. They were growing like gangbusters. It's like everybody just replace all your lights with grow lights and live a happier life, uh, <laughs> in my opinion, in my humble opinion. Okay, so that's light. So yeah, I think a big problem a lot of people do is they get a succulent arrangement and then they put it in the center of their living room table, five feet from a window, and then those succulents don't look so good. So let's talk about stretching, etioliation, the long fancy word for it. What do we need to know about stretching? Because that's a big problem for people. Yes. Okay. Before we talk about stretching, I want to talk about the succulent arrangements. People get really upset when their succulent arrangement starts to stretch or get kind of mangy. 
and they kind of get angry about it. But people never expect a bouquet of cut flowers to last seven longer than seven to 10 days, right? Because once the roots are cut off, that's kind of it. But you can actually enjoy a succulent arrangement for months. Even when it starts to stretch a little bit, it's beautiful. So if it's not your jam, if you don't want to maintain succulents, but you like them, you can get an arrangement. It's okay. Enjoy it for three or four months. It lasts longer than the cut roses. And then just go get another one. People just get up in arms about succulents for some reason and the arrangement. So I just wanted to throw that out there. Like if you just like them, but you're okay with just replacing them the same way you do with roses, go for it. I love that. I'm all about diffusing what people get up in arms about in the plant community in general. But that's a perspective shift, right? Like you can bring the succulent arrangement home thinking that it's going to be perfect forever, or you can just bring it knowing that you're going to enjoy it while you have it. And then you can compost those succulents. You can, you know, we talk about in my book and on my show how to get rid of plants when they're not bringing you joy. And at least in California, succulent arrangements are affordable. In New York, not so much, but you can also make your own. Or if you have an arrangement of 20, but there's one that isn't doing well, you can go to your local garden center, grab an Echeveria and just pull that one out and pop it in. Like you can start playing puzzle pieces, you know, with it. So I think that's a really interesting perspective shift you just offered. So thank you. Yeah, no problem. It's something that I have to say quite often because people really do get up in arms about that. Okay. Stretching. Back to stretching. Yes. Like I said earlier, there are some succulents that need a lot more light than others. Echeverias being one of them. And even within the Echeveria family, there are some that can actually handle being on a windowsill and being very happy. And then others that would need a grow light or actually do better outside. A lot of that is trial and error. But one of the things like you mentioned is the color of the plant. The more color it has, typically the more light it needs in order to maintain its shape. Now, the Echeverias are rosettes. So they're usually compact. The chubby ones, the leaves will kind of curve and have this beautiful little shape. Now, the first sign of a succulent starting to stretch is that the leaves will open up. That's the first sign. So if you see that, it's time to move your plant to someplace that gets more light or invest in a grow light. Then it will start to get taller and taller and there'll be space in between the leaves. Now, at that point, it's almost a goner and you probably just need to propagate it and start over. But the more space there is between leaves and the more open the leaves are, it means that it's starting to stretch. Yeah, it's the leaves are literally searching for light. So it's interesting when it's opening, it's like, son, where are you? Where are you? And then the opening doesn't work. So it starts moving. So yes, sadly, we are sadly reporting if your succulent has just thrown, quote unquote, thrown off a lot of new growth, actually it's looking for light and you need to give it some more light. So say I have an Echeveria that the center kind of has run off. Can you cut that part that is stretching off? But then oftentimes if a plant starts to stretch, like the bottom remains intact, but then the top starts getting leggy, can I just kind of cut off the leggy part and then pop it in more light? Yes. And the fun part about that is where it was cut off, new babies will grow. And it's just a really fun thing to watch as it happens. Sometimes it'll just be one. Sometimes it'll be three or four and you actually will get three or four new plants. And then the part that you cut off, you can put that in soil under a grow light and then that will grow into a new plant too. It's kind of a good way to- Then you got two plants. Right. Increase your collection. Boom. Love it. Or you can just start plucking those leaves and then you can propagate a whole bunch of plants. But we won't get there yet. We won't get there yet. Talk to me about soil. That's another thing that succulents are a little particular about. Yes. They need to be in fast draining soil because like we said earlier, they're prone to root rot. It's really important to have amended soil. You can buy cactus succulent soil already made and that's a preference you know some people like certain brands over others you can also make your own by buying a high quality potting soil and amending it with something like pumice or perlite turfus coarse sand coarse sand's not my favorite that's also controversial some people love it some people don't i typically don't use coarse sand but pumice perlite or even turfus i think are great for amending the soil yeah, I feel like there was a brief moment a couple years ago, maybe a year ago, when like making your own soil was all the rage and everyone was posting their soil recipes. And it's like so much of our exploration of plants as adults, I think, is like an invitation to go back to 
being a little kid, being like a little mad scientist, you know, Bill Nye or whatever, like just getting your hands dirty and playing. And yeah, I feel like there's a little mad scientist in me that sometimes gets excited to make her own soil. And then I'm like, nah, I'm over this. Just give me the bagged cactus mix and I'm good. It is an interesting exercise, even if you have like kids or just if you want to try it once to like put normal bagged mix in one hand and put cacti mix in the other hand, just to see what the difference of like what quote unquote, what the hell does fast draining soil really mean, right? It's an interesting little experiment to do. And also, I mean, it goes without saying, but in case we have newbie, newbie, newbies in here, don't pot your succulents or houseplants in general, just in like soil you dig up outside, use a bagged mix. They're sterile. You don't want to bring in bugs. And normally our soils outside have way too much clay in them, which is not fast draining, the opposite of fast draining. Yes. And there's also a difference between if you go to the store to buy the soil, there's a difference between potting soil and gardening soil. The potting soil typically runs clearer. If you use garden soil, I learned that the hard way. When you water it, all this black mucky stuff comes out, but that doesn't happen as often with potting soil. Yeah, totally. Okay, so I am always on the hunt for new podcasts to listen to, and I figured if you're listening to this podcast, you might be too. So if you're looking for another show that nourishes your soul, then you have to check out No Small Endeavor, produced by my friends at Great Feeling Studios and PRX. No Small Endeavor explores what it means to live meaningfully just like this show. In each episode, award-winning professor and host Lee C. Camp brings you thoughtful conversations with artists, philosophers, and theologians like The Office actor Rain Wilson and West Wing's Michael Sheen about what it means to truly flourish. If you need a place to start, I highly recommend their recent episode with New York Times bestselling author Gretchen Rubin. The conversation is all about what it takes to be happy day by day. So go ahead, plant friend. Go follow No Small Endeavor on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts and tell them I sent you. That's no small endeavor. Okay, cool. So we did water, we did light, we did stretching, we did soil. Do we miss anything for care? I just want to throw airflow in there, especially if you're going to be a collector, which I hope you will be because succulents are amazing. Having All you need is a little fan. If you have a shelf or it's where you're storing your plants and you have grow lights, just get a little fan and blow some air at it for a few hours every single day. That'll really help with the growth and keeping you happy. It also keeps pests at bay. Yeah. That is, I feel like seed starters, people who start their own seeds for their gardens know that trick because when you're starting your seeds, you need that fan on them. But I feel like that is something overlooked in the houseplant space. But in general, I feel like for our bodies too, it's nice to just have some airflow. My husband's a big ceiling fan guy. Is it on all the time? Does he like them running all the time? Yes. And we just got a baby bird and my bird, he might chirp. He's sleeping right now, but he might chirp throughout this episode. Getting a baby bird as a podcaster, should have thought twice about that. But no regrets because I'm obsessed with him. But anyway, the other day he went for a flight. He got out of my office when I wasn't looking. And I was like, oh, my God, the ceiling fans. And thank God I found him before he went in our our bedroom where the ceiling fan is always running because my husband is particular about that. Anyway, I digress. I try and bring up my baby bird in every single episode. It feels like these days. Okay, back to succulents. Okay, let's talk propagation because I remember having such a succulent propagation hyperfixation at one point. I remember making like mandalas in a little dish of soil with all the different succulent leaves. I mean, there's nothing cuter. You were just talking about when we cut the top off, little babies grow. Like the only thing cuter than like a nice, juicy, chubby succulent is a teensy, tiny, little baby succulent. Yes. They're so cute. They're adorable. And it's so fun. If you can make fun little designs with the little babies too. There's just there's just something really sweet and cute about tiny things, but especially the chunky, chunky succulents. So can you walk us through, like say, everybody probably has one succulent lying around in their house. If I wanted to experiment with propagation today, how would I go about doing that? Well, there are a few different ways to propagate a succulent. I think the most fun is propagating by leaves. Now, not all succulents can be propagated by leaves, but you can propagate graptivarias, echeverias, jades, calanchoes. Those all can be propagated by leaves. And it's really not that hard. A lot of times people overthink it. And I think everybody who is new to succulents and then they find out that they can increase their collection or they find out about leaf propagation, everyone gets obsessed for a little bit. I did. I actually went and bought 50 plants 
because I decided I was going to grow a bunch and I took all the leaves off. That's a lot of leaves of plant. That's a lot of leaves. I know. I know. But I, I'm a little obsessive about things when I love it and I go all in. And that's what I did. And most of them grew, which is really exciting. How many plants did you end up with? Oh, I don't remember. I ended up giving a bunch away and using them in designs. I think I had three eight foot tables, eight foot rectangle tables full of leaves. It was insanity. I'll never do that again. I I shouldn't say never, but it's not anything I want to do right now. But the thing with the leaves is that you don't have to overthink it. It's really fun, like you said, to make the little shapes with them and you put them on soil and you put the leaves down. But really, that doesn't really have to happen. If you have a dropped leaf, all you have to do is put it aside and don't even think about it. You want to protect it from extreme light and water because you don't want it to rot or, you know, get soaked. But if it's going to grow into a plant, it will. There's nothing that you have to do. I know in a lot of succulent groups, people will say every third day, you have to mist it and make sure that you don't have to do any of that. Because what's amazing is that everything that it needs to grow is inside the leaf. You don't have to do anything until the mother leaf falls off and it has roots and rosette and then you put it on soil and then that's when you water it and make sure that it gets light. And baby succulents actually need more water than a mature succulent with a mature root system. So it's actually okay to water the babies more often than the mature ones. So now when you're propagating succulent leaves, are you just putting them on a dish with no medium or are you, how are you doing your propagations now successfully? Well, now when I have them, I have a basket and I just throw all the leaves in there and I sort of shuffle them around every couple of days and see what's growing. Most of them grow, but sometimes there'll be a little rip that it's not entirely noticeable when I put it in the basket. And if the leaf is ripped or the little note at the end isn't all the way attached, it's not going to grow. So it has to be a healthy, intact leaf in order to grow. So there's no, to me, it's a waste of time to create all the patterns for a leaf that may not grow. And then you take it away and then the pattern is just not pretty. So I wait until I see growth. And then when there's some root and rosette, then I'll put it on soil and then just let it do its thing. Okay. So let's dive deeper for listeners who might not be going for volume, but just going for like, this is my first succulent I've propagated. I don't know what I'm doing. I want to try. You're talking about the node. Well, first off, you mentioned, you know, that you need to leave it aside. I know that it's very important for that callus to develop. So can you talk about what taking a full leaf looks like? And can you go a little bit deeper into what you were just talking about, about the rip and stuff like that? Yes. When it's attached to the stem, I don't know the science, so I don't know the actual words behind it, but there's a little node at the end of the leaf that attaches to the stem. And if you slightly twist it right and left, it'll just pop right off the stem. And then you can tell when you look at the end of the leaf, if it's been cut or if if it's still intact. Like usually there's a tiny little, almost like a little bump in the center and you'll know that it's a healthy leaf. And then you just have to put it aside. Now, and as far as the leaves are concerned, for plants like Echeverias and Graptivarias, the bottom leaves are the older leaves, the top leaves are the newer leaves, and then the middle ones are obviously the ones that are right in the middle. You can take the bottom leaves off, but you actually have a better chance of success of propagating if you kind of go a little bit higher and get some of the middle leaves because they're still young and healthy, but more mature than the newer leaves and the bottom leaves might be on their way out because you know what the bottom leaves will get crispy and fall off. So trying to get a leaf that you can get the bottom leaves and try it. There's no reason you can't, but getting a little bit higher, you have a higher chance of propagating. So that's something to consider when you're taking a leaf off of your plant. Love it. Yeah. Cause I feel like with my Echeveria that I have right now, those bottom leaves are already kind of turning yellow, kind of browning, like they're going to fall off just naturally. Okay, so we're moving the whole leaf and you want to make sure that the whole leaf comes off because you want to make sure it's like a clean twist from the stem. You're letting that callus, so like there's going to be that juicy part with the vascular system exposed. You let that callus off and then you're chilling and you're waiting until you see a sign of growth, which is going to be like a teensy little baby. Is it a rosette that pops out for a second? Let's let's just operate with an Echeveria. Is it a rosette or is it just a one baby leaf? Well, it actually depends. Sometimes you'll start to see little pink roots and no, I call them plantlets or a little plantlet. Or sometimes you get the little baby Echeveria, the plantlet and no root. The best case scenario is both roots and the plantlet. That way, you know, you have a really good plant. In my experience, if it's just roots, even after the, like, 
the mother leaf is about to wither and fall off, you're not going to get a plant. But if you have no roots but a plantlet and the mother leaf falls off, you still put that on soil and it will grow roots. So it's better to have a plantlet and roots. That's the ideal situation or the little plantlet, even if there are no roots. Okay. Love this. Once we see the plantlet and the roots, then what? Then it's go time. Yes. Then you can put it on soil. But even then, you don't necessarily have to because it's getting everything that it needs to grow from the leaf that it's still attached to. It's really go time when the leaf withers and falls off. Then you really have to put it on soil. But you can do it before and then just let magic happen if you want. So are you waiting for the leaf to fully be withered before you're removing it? And how are you removing it? Are you twisting it? Are you cutting it? Like what are best practices there? I usually just let them fall off. They will be super wrinkly and dry and sometimes they'll still be stuck. And at that point, I'll pop it off. But if there's still any life left in the mother leaf, I just like to leave it alone because it's still doing its job. And let's just dive into the beauty of that plant life parallel. I mean, it's so poetic on so many different ways, like the mother plant giving all of her nutrients to her offspring that will live on beyond it. I know you had a beautiful reel talking about this exact thing. Do you want to share? We'll put the reel, the specific reel in the show notes, but can you share kind of that life lesson for you in this one moment of propagation? Yeah. So one of the reasons I love to propagate and from a leaf is because the leaf teaches us that we have everything we need inside of us to thrive. So the succulent leaf, I actually have one right here, which is really bizarre, but (laughs) I just looked down and there's, there's one right here, which is too funny. I have them everywhere. So this little leaf will start to grow on its own. It doesn't need extra light. It doesn't need extra water because everything that it needs inside of it to grow is already there. Now, at some point, it's going to need help. It's going to need light. It's going to need water. But the basics to start, it has everything it needs to thrive. And that's how we are too. I think a lot of times we doubt ourselves. We're always looking outside of ourselves for answers, asking people for their opinions, reading another book or whatever it is that we do. When if we just take a moment to think about what we need to thrive, we already know. But where we need help, yes. And it's okay to ask for help for us to thrive in our own particular way. But the basics, we already got. We don't need to ask anybody. We got it. We know how to do it. I love it. And also to take that a step further, like when you think about going outside of yourself to ask for help, which we all inevitably will, which is the soil and the light and the you know water, all those figurative things that we're talking about, you also have to think about the quality, right? Like when I go look for that help, I'm looking for quality soil. I'm looking for quality advice. I'm not going to that low vibration person that's going to like absolutely shoot my idea down or give me bad advice or or the person that just says yes to you all the time. Or maybe it's about the light, the positivity, like going to find more, where can I go find more positive leaders? Or, you know, lately I've been listening to a lot of Abraham Hicks in the morning. Do you know who that is? Yes. Yeah. So, and Abraham Hicks is like super woo for those, you know, well, proceed with caution if you are a only slightly spiritual person. But yeah, like Abraham Hicks is like, I turn on in the morning on YouTube and she's just like who elevates my spirits and like brings that positivity, that light in. So I think too, like that quality of when you go outside of yourself, like who are you looking to support you in that way is also real deep. Really important. They are. And you just gave me another embrace the suck message. So I appreciate that. Tell me. Well, that's that's what I call my embrace the suck. And it's about like the quality soil in the air. and, And that's really important for our growth too. So that's a good one. Thank you. Yeah. I have a whole page in my book of plant care, self-care parallels for like the soil, the light, the whatever, because I just, I don't know. Everything's a plant life parallel if you look hard enough. It really is. Yeah, I agree. And that's why everyone should have a plant in their life, succulents or otherwise. Yeah, I love it. Okay, so I feel like leaf propagation is probably the best place to start for people if they want to learn about cuttings, they can go follow your account. I'm sure you've got blogs about it. But I'm loving, I want to just like rant, for lack of a better term, if you're an Abraham Hicks fan, I want to rant on some plant life parallels with you, succulent style. So just suck it. That's the catchphrase or your plant life parallels. Embrace the suck. Embrace the suck. I love that. So hit me with a couple more embrace the suck things that you think, you know, if our listeners have a succulent, what embrace the suck moment could they do with their succulent today? Well, environment is really important. So if you take a sun-loving succulent and put it somewhere where it doesn't get a lot of light, it's not going to thrive. 
And if you take a succulent that needs bright shade or will get crispy crittered in the sun and you put it out in the sun, it's just going to get crispy crittered. And so sometimes it's not you that's the problem. Sometimes it's the environment that you're in that is affecting how you thrive. So sometimes you just have to change environments. I'm all about personal responsibility and figuring out what your role is in anything that's happening in your life. But sometimes you can be doing your best, but if the environment is not supporting you, you have to move. You got to move. You got to go find that light, baby. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think too, as I'm just like ruminating on this, I feel like we're both examples of this plantlet idea of not propagation, but you know, there are succulents that will grow babies on them and the babies can grow big and like everybody can live happily or the mother dies back and then the baby takes on its life. Our careers are both kind of like that. Like we had one succulent career and then we had this little baby whisper of a, you know, other passion that then kind of grew and you coming from corporate wellness and now talking about the power of succulents, me coming from performing and having a podcast, like you can see how that original job drains and supports the new job. Yes. I'm actually a social worker. I went to school to be a social worker. I did social work for many, many years. So I've always been about empowerment and helping people find what works best for them in order for them to live their best life, whatever that looks like, because that's what a social worker does, because what works for me may not work for somebody else. So if there's a way that I can help people think about what will help them thrive, however that looks, I'm going to share it. And oddly enough, succulents have given me the biggest opportunity to do that out of anything that I've ever done from corporate wellness and even doing social work. Succulents have helped me do it. It's amazing. And then I love succulents. In addition to that, you know, it's just such a blessing. I was just on someone else's podcast earlier today, and I was saying, like, I have spent thousands of dollars on wellness retreats, therapy, self-help books, and the freaking $4 potted plant on my windowsill and my little windowsill herb garden was like the biggest teacher. And they are. I mean, plants, I think, are such an affordable, accessible opportunity to see your life reflected back to you. What's been your most powerful lesson learned from your succulents? I love that you say they're like your little life coaches. <laughs> it's the fact that they adapt and thrive, we have the same ability to do it. And it's really easy when we're faced with challenges and it feels like there's no answer to think like, oh, it's over. Like when you cut the roots off of a succulent, they grow back. They always do. And while they're growing back, they may not look pretty. They're healing. All the energy is going to growing back the roots, but the roots always grow back and they thrive again. And if you live long enough as a person, you're going to face a challenge in your life where it feels like your roots have been cut off. But if you're still alive, you have a 100% success rate of getting through the challenging times. Was it always pretty? No, but it was temporary. And looking at succulents helped me remember that. A year ago, I had something happen with my business that maybe five years ago would have made me quit. But I thought, okay, I guess I'm going to have to adapt and thrive like my succulents. I'm going to have to you know, live what it is that I share every single day. And it's, I really think it's because of the succulents that I was able to get through it and have fun while I was doing it. So that's one of the biggest things that succulents have done for me. Yeah, that's beautiful. I love that. Nature is such a powerful, for lack of a better word, like rooter. Like it helps you root into perspective. It helps you root into yourself. It helps you root into just so much. And I also think that perspective that plants can bring us, whether they're succulents or houseplants, but the perspective of like, none of this is that deep, but all of it is very deep. And that adaptation, like it's within you and you don't know that it's within you until it's time to adapt. And then you're shown that you're so much stronger than you ever thought you could be. And I think coming out of this last three years, I think we've all probably been met with some sort of adversity that we had to overcome and didn't know that we had it in us. So thanks succulents. Thanks plants. Thanks nature. Thanks Gaia. Thanks mother nature for teaching us all the lessons we need to know. <laughs> and on that note, <laughs> where can we find you? Tell us your website. Tell us your Instagram. You make really cool reels. And what offerings do you have? I know you have a membership. You've got succulent deliveries. Do you have a membership for succulent deliveries? No, I have a membership called Sucky Friends, and it's where plant care or succulent care and self-care collide. So every I have a membership portal, and every week there is a post about succulent care and something about self-care. So it might be about communication. It might be about relationships, just something that will help them thrive. And then fun fact about succulent. And then we have a monthly Sucky Friends happy hour where we go live and sometimes I have expert guests and 
this week or this month, we're actually doing a succulent show and tell where we're all going to share our favorite succulents with each other. So that's fun. So that's the membership, Sucky Friends. It's on my website. On Instagram and Facebook, I'm just suck it. S-U-C-C. If you put S-U-C-K, I'm not responsible for whatever comes up in your search. My mother's done that, unfortunately. She was Googling just suck it on, on the internet. And I said, oh, that was your fault, mom. I'm just suck it.com for my website. And on TikTok, I'm just suck it OC. Just suck it OC. Okay. Orange County. Yes. Okay, cool. Well, it was so nice meeting you and I'm excited to continue following you. And, you know, we're so aligned in our mission to help people thrive. And I hope more of us come along so that we can just help everybody live happy lives with nature. Yes, I agree. Thank you so much for having me. This was really, really fun. Thank you so much, Andrea. This was such a fun conversation. I love her mindfulness approach to succulents. It obviously reminds me so much of my book, Growing Joy, and how I see life lessons in my house plants. Andrea sees them in succulents, and it was so fun to have this informative and deep conversation about what succulents can teach us and how we can grow them. If you want to follow her, you can follow her at Just Suck It. That's her social channels and her website. She's awesome. And I just want to wish another amazing congratulations to Marcia, our beloved listener who fulfilled this longtime dream of hers to launch her own plant shop in Las Vegas. It's called Rooting For You. You can go follow her at Rooting For You LV on socials and go visit her in Las Vegas. The shop is called Rooting For You. I'm so proud of you, Marcia. So proud to know you and look forward to chatting more with you in the platform. If you're interested in joining us on our platform, you can go to jointhegardensociety.com and select the community plan that interests you. I can't wait to meet you in there. And let's see, plant friends, this week we're celebrating succulent, so I hope you can go spend some time with succulent. I have one succulent on my desk that's actually planted in some crystal. And after my conversation with Andrea, I realized it was really underwatered, so I gave it a big drink, and it's been so fun to watch it kind of come back to life. It was flat like she talked about, and it's totally kind of come back up into that cup shape. It's an Echeveria. And man, I hope you're enjoying spring into summer. We're almost at the summer solstice already. I can't believe it. And until next time, my sweet plant friends, I hope you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show so you don't miss an episode. We have incredible episodes lined up in 2023, and I don't want you to miss one topic. And while you're subscribing, would you mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review? Reviews are tremendously helpful for the growth of the podcast. So I thank you in advance for helping this podcast reach as many planty earbuds as possible across the globe. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Growing Joy content, we've got a ton of free options for you. First, there's the Plant Parent Personality Test. It's so fun. It takes literally three minutes to complete. You take the test, you get your Plant Parent Personality Profile and a curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are right up your alley, tailored just for you, inspired by your results. The link is in the show notes. Make sure to let me know what your personality is after you take the test. If you're looking to uplevel your plant parent game, check out my website. We've got a bunch of free guides that you can download on topics like understanding natural light, which is actually a three-day worksheet, and nine ways to green up your office if you need to bring a little bit of planty joy into your work life. And finally, I want to invite you to join the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet, my online garden society. It's both a web platform and an iOS and Android app. It allows our listeners to get together in an algorithm and troll-free online space to swap plant care tips, humble brag about plant wins, and get support when you have plant fails. We have monthly live planty show and tells on Zoom, which are so fun, and even have a living library of planty book recommendations sourced from our community. You can go to jointhegardensociety.com to grab your membership. And for anything else, plant friend, I am here for you. Feel free to drop me a line, whether you have an idea for an episode, an event, or maybe you're even a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, following me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and tips is always recommended. You can find me across socials at Growing Joy with Maria. Thank you again so much for listening. It is truly my honor and life's delight to help you keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant care is self-care on Growing Joy, the podcast. 
make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of Plant Friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click Click the community plan. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. (music) 